Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. So there are two new and important documents on the Idaho 4 case. I am going to read these for you real quick. The first one is defendant's motion to allow certain experts and investigators protected access to view IgG materials. Now recently the judge made the decision to allow certain IgG information to be released, but it's sealed, so they need permission. So, comes now Brian C. Koberger buying through his attorneys and hereby moves this court for an order allowing certain experts and investigators protected access to view IgG materials. Counsel for Mr. Koberger has received, reviewed the materials currently available under the court sealed order for disclosure of IgG information and protective order filed with the court on 12-29-23 and requests the court to include additional members of the defense team access to the materials. Mr. Koberger specifically requests the current protective order to expand and allow defense experts Dr. Leah Larkin, Vicka Barlow, and Stephen Mercer access to the materials. Further, Mr. Koberger re requests that the criminal investigators that are part of the defense team be allowed to have access to the materials as well. Expanding the current protective order to include additional members of the defense team and experts include each person, each additional person, subject to the restrictions of the protective order. This request is grounded in Mr. Koberger's Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel and counsel's ongoing duty to investigate the case brought against Mr. Koberger. Access to these materials is necessary to investigate how and when Mr. Koberger was identified as a suspect. Hmm. Let me review this. That last sentence, kind of interesting. It seems like they, their main priority from day one, they have always wanted to know how and when Brian Koberger was identified by the police. They seem to always hone in on that. That's what they really want to know. And hmm, I guess they want to see if there's anything else, but I, they always say that in each motion that they've had related to IgG, they really want to know how and when he was identified as a suspect. They want to know how they got to him. So that also leads me to believe that some of the information that the judge allowed them to have shows some of the steps that were taken, but did not give the defense the how and when he was identified as a suspect. So they're wanting to bring in their own investigators, which Leah Larkin is an IgG expert. So very interesting. Okay, so now I'm going to come to the, this is really important, don't get me wrong, but the other one that's more important, in my opinion, is this one. So they just had that hearing, the one that was um, closed to the public, so we didn't get to hear it, right? But, so here's the decision. The judge made this decision pretty quickly. So the judge has made an order denying the defendant's motion to reconsider and motion for permissive appeal. Um, the defense wanted permission to appeal now rather than wait until after conviction. But the judge just said, nope. So this one is eight pages long. I am not going to read the whole thing. I will save this and upload this into the private Facebook group. So if you want to see the whole thing, the link will be down below in the description for the group. And don't worry, I don't need your real name. I don't need to know who you are on YouTube versus Facebook. Some people make you say who you are both ways. It's none of my business, none of my concerns. So but anyway, just to let you know, your privacy is respected. So if you'd like to get all eight pages of this, go ahead and go over there. Um, I am going to just kind of skim through this and read just the important parts, or you can pause at any time just to read it on your screen. So it goes over the background and it says, this is an ongoing criminal prosecution of four counts 
of unaliving in the first degree and one count of burglary. Goes over the date of November 13th, 2022. He was charged on December 30th and has been in custody since that time. So let's see. Says he waived his right to a speedy trial. They were going to have trial back in October. And let's see. Back in July was when the defense filed the original motion to dismiss indictments. And they did another one. They filed another motion to dismiss ground, based on grounds of biased grand jury, admissible evidence, and all these other things that you see here. It was a really long title. So that hearing was held back in October. And then on December 15th, the judge denied both of those motions. So then that's how we got to the hearing that was just held last week, December 21st, 2023. The defense filed a motion to reconsider or in the alternative permission to appeal from interlocutory orders in the stay of proceedings. This order denies that. So it says again, a two-part hearing. The first portion, portion was closed. The second portion just on the, um, the standard required for a grand jury indictment, that part was public. Goes over a little bit. Okay. To date, a trial has yet to be scheduled. They're continuing to work through discovery and trial preparation. Let's see. He says, given the immense amount of potential evidence, defense counsel is represented that represented, represented, I can't talk tonight. Given the immense amount of potential evidence, defense counsel has represented that the earliest a trial should be scheduled is spring 2025 and more realistically, summer 2025. The state would prefer setting in summer 2024, but also acknowledge that a trial in summer 2025 would be more realistic. Yeah, that sucks, huh? Okay. There is a lot of case law cited here, different cases that they use. It's a lot right here. Okay, it says here, a motion for reconsideration may be filed on or based on new evidence or calculated to draw the court's attention to errors of law or fact in the initial decision. Okay, it says, however, the trial court's assessment of the desirability of allowing an interlocutory appeal is of great importance. A trial court's role under IAR 12 is to differentiate between those interlocutory orders for which an appeal ought to be permitted because an immediate appeal will ultimately facilitate the lit litigation and those where an appeal would unduly disrupt the case or unfairly prejudice a party. The trial court is generally in a far better position than an appellate court to evaluate this factor. Although the appellate court may grant permission for an appeal despite the trial court's refusal to do so, the explanation given by the trial court for its decision provides important information for the appellate court's consideration. This is the judge saying, I'm covering all my bases. I'm making sure that because they are still going to appeal, that's still going to happen later if he's convicted. He's basically saying he's leaving a really good paper trail of all of those case laws that he cited above. Okay, then it goes on to say um, an appeal may be taken on an interlocutory order under very limited circumstances. It must involve a controlling question of law as to which there is substantial grounds for difference of opinion. And I remember him speaking about this at the hearing. He was like, there is no difference of opinion across the state regarding the grand jury. So, and here he says, second, it must appear that an immediate appeal from the order may materially advance the orderly resolution of the litigation. In addition to the factors set forth in IAR 12, a court determining whether to hear an interlocutory appeal should also consider, quote, the impact of an immediate appeal upon the parties, the effect of the delay of the proceedings in the district court pending the appeal, the likelihood or possibility of a second appeal after judgment is finally entered by the district court and the case workload of the appellate courts. It says, um, 
it only creates an appeal in the exceptional case and does not broaden the appeals which may be taken as a matter of right. His analysis um, for the reasons articulated on the record on January 26, 2024, defendant's motion for reconsideration is denied. The order denying motion to dismiss indictment for inaccurate instructions to grand jury and all of those, my lord, it was a long title, right? Are both soundly rooted in case law, constitutional law, statutes, and criminal rules. The court does not find error with any factual findings or application of well-settled law to the facts as found. In reaching its decision, the court spent a significant amount of time reviewing the grand jury proceedings and researching the issues presented by defendant. Reconsideration does not change the court's decisions. Again, a motion to deny. Talks about the well settled law again. This um, Idaho criminal C- C- rule 6.6 expressly states that a motion to dismiss the indictment may be granted by the district court for, quote, a valid challenge to an individual juror who served on the grand jury that found the indictment, except that finding of the valid challenge to one or more members of the grand jury is not grounds for dismissal of the indictment if there were 12 or more qualified jurors concurring in the finding of the indictment, unquote. He goes on to say here that the only path forward for either side is a trial. Additionally, as time passes, both sides are faced with the reality that witnesses' memories may fade or witnesses may become available, which may cause prejudice to one or both sides. Finally, while the court remains steadfast in its obligation to ensure defendants' constitutional rights are protected, the court is also mindful of the victim's family's constitutional right to timely disposition of the case. An appeal now would not advance defendants' rights or the rights of the victim's families. As outlined above, the impact of an appeal now on the parties would not be favorable to either side, and the effect of further delay of these proceedings may result in prejudice to one or both parties. Finally, if defendant is convicted by a trial jury, and especially if the death penalty is imposed, there will be undoubtedly years of appeals to come where the issues raised by defendant now may be reviewed by a higher court. For these reasons, defendant's motion for permission to appeal is denied. John C. Judge. Well, I knew that this was going to happen only because um, I personally, I worked at a law firm for many years, almost seven, and it was a large criminal defense firm. And, you know, the bigger the firm, the better the attorneys, off most of the time. Um, there were a lot of these filed. It's not that uncommon for a motion for an interlocutory kind of appeal hearing to happen. But in seven years that I was there, I only saw one get granted, and it's it was a big deal when that one got per, got granted. They are extremely rare to be granted, but they're not rare to be filed. You'll find them in a lot of these cases. So I wasn't surprised to see it, but and I'm not surprised to see that he denied it. The other one, this one, is actually more interesting to me their motion to allow um, certain experts and investigators restricted access to view the IgG materials. This one I think is really interesting. I wonder if they're going to have a hearing on this or if the judge will just answer via an order. Um, Some of them they've had hearings on and with some of them they'll just wait for the other side. So the defense has made their motion. The state will likely come back and file a response. And then, you know, the memos, memorandums, and affidavits in support of their memorandums, things like that. Then the judge will come back and make his decision or you know, actually go back one more step. The defense could also do another reply to the state's reply. It could go back and forth a few times. Then the judge can make a decision. Now, or... The state may ask for a hearing or the defense may come back and ask for a hearing on this motion. So we'll wait and find out what they do um, and if we'll get to see that hearing, if they do have a hearing on it. 
because this right here is really interesting stuff. This is going to be the most important part of the trial, the DNA found on the sheath. That is the state's biggest piece of evidence, at least that we know about, you know. There is, again, I want to stress this, I can't stress this enough, the PCA is by far not the only evidence that the state has, and it doesn't have to be their best evidence either. It is only just enough probable cause for arrest. That's literally in the name, PCA. So there is a ton of information and evidence that we have no clue about. We get to find that all out at trial, right along with everybody else. It's going to be a lot. And it's. I think this case is going to hinge on the cast, the DNA, all the cell phone data. It's going to be a very technical um, case. And I think it's going to be kind of a battle of the experts, you know. So we'll see what happens. That is it for this evening. I know I've been talking a little fast, but I wanted to get this out here as quickly as I could. And since the other order was eight pages, I kind of rushed through it. So that is the update for now. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time.